my time. It this looks, meeting is being recorded. It looks like it is noon, so we will uh, go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Michelle Rakowski, and today I will be presenting the final installment of Many Hands, the people who made the Wisconsin Quilt Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts. Today's presentation will focus on the women I spoke with over the course of the oral history project. And before we uh, dive in, I'd like to thank our sponsors, the American Quilt Study Group, Kohler Foundation, and Wisconsin Arts Board with support from the National Endowment for the Arts. Now, as I said, my name is Michelle Rakowski. I'm a graduate student at UW-Milwaukee. I'm working towards my master's in library science and museum studies. I've been working as an intern for the Wisconsin Museum of Quilts and Fiber Arts this past year, recording oral histories. This project began last year as a celebration of the museum's 10th anniversary. I had the honor of collecting oral histories from some of the people who were instrumental to its founding and its ongoing success. I'd like to note before we go any further um, that oral histories are all about the memories of the participants. So if at any point in the video clips or uh, some of the stories that I'm gonna be sharing, something doesn't mesh with your own knowledge of events, that's okay, don't be alarmed because oral histories are very personal. And as I mentioned before, today's focus will be on the women who shared their stories with me. And as I share stories, um, please feel free to post your own stories in the chat or in the comments. Because I think this will be a really fun one for everyone to reminisce. So the first section that we're going to dive into is all about getting involved how and when, uh, in some cases why, these women that I spoke with became a part of uh, the WMQFA. We're going, to be, well, uh, we're going to be starting off with this clip from an earlier interview that was done with Kay Walters. She is going way back to the very beginning, even before the Wisconsin Quilt History Project. Uh, she's sharing how Luella Doss kind of got the ball rolling uh, when she founded the Wisconsin Quilters Group in 1981. And I've typed out uh, the short portion of Kay's interview that's kind of difficult to hear. Uh, the audio broke up a bit. Luella, Luella Doss was the minister and in shape. And then from that, she wanted to start a quilt documentation project for the state of Wisconsin. Other states had, had done it previously, and we had not done anything in Wisconsin to document quilts. It was these pre existing fiber arts communities, such as the one that Wella founded, and quilters' guilds and fiber arts businesses that really formed the starting point for a lot of the people who joined the project, particularly early on. Kathleen Briggs is another example of how connections within the quilting community led many early supporters to the Wisconsin Quilt History Project. Kathleen shared how she and her mother got involved with documentation days. In the photo that you're seeing, Kathleen is on the left, uh, in this picture from the groundbreaking, and then Karen Leonard uh, is standing to her right in the beautiful pink, pink blouse. In 1975, my mother and I took a class at the Sherwood Opportunity School, and Carol Jacobson taught the class of classic quilt block patterns and that have historical significance as well as those that were popular in the 20s and 30s, like Sunbonnet, and Sue, and Fisherman Fred, and then, uh, of course, the butterfly quilt, uh, like my great grandmother made for me. And then there was a waterfall picture, which I had never seen before, but she put one of those in the quilt. And um, Carol was very careful to tell us about everything going 
So as you can see, as someone who is uh, Michelle, already extremely- Michelle, I'm yes. sorry to interrupt you. Um, your The presentation is not up. You're not sharing yet. It's yeah. not sharing? Nope. <laughs> uh, has it not been sharing this whole time? Nope. What the heck? There you go, now you got it. It hasn't, oh, I'm so sorry, everyone. Um, were you guys able, <laughs> were you guys able to hear anything? We could, yep, we could hear everything. We just couldn't see the uh, video or the pictures. So, oh, that's and weird. go ahead and move that to full screen. Um, Cause right now we're seeing uh, the bottom of it's kind of cut off. Um, I don't know why it's doing that. There you go. That's, that's it. <laughs> All right. There you go. You better? Yep. That okay. looks good. <laughs> well, I'm sorry about that uh, technical snafu, everyone. Um, but I suppose we will uh, keep moving. <laughs> so here we have um, a piece from Sandy Meyer. Uh, she shared with me uh, how this jacket led to her connection to the museum. And I'm going to read uh, her words that she shared with me. <clears throat> and I quote, I first became involved with the museum when I accidentally met Luella Doss at the Wisconsin Badger Rose Bowl game. I made a pieced badger jacket that I wore to the game. Luella and her husband Judd were also attending and she spotted me wearing the jacket in the hotel before we went to the parade. She invited me to put the jacket in the 2011 exhibit of Wisconsin Fiber Art Pieces. Here's a photo from that exhibit that was still in the little stone building before the barn opened. I loved this story from Sandy um, because it showed how sometimes it was simple chance and accident that led people uh, to become connected to the museum. Even though clearly with a talented piece quite quite like this, she was already a part of the quilting community. Next, we have this clip from Linda Roos Benson. Um, she's connect was connected to the museum both through knowing volunteers and board members, um, but she was also inherently tied to the museum as an owner of a quilt shop. before it was even um, developed because um, we had a we had a, actually had a quilt shop in Brown Deer and um, someone from the museum dropped off a, a jar for us to start collecting money so so the museum could actually uh, eventually be built and so we started collecting money here and there from different customers and then uh, as time went on, um, we heard that it was going to be um, the ground, there was going to be a groundbreaking, it was going to be developed. And uh, we knew uh, Terry Kirchner and knew a lot of the other people that were really, really involved in this. So as she was starting to say there, she knew a lot of the people um, who were involved as board members and volunteers, and that helped lead to her further involvement in the exhibit that she has the poster from uh, behind her, from Insects to Elephants, which was one that she was heavily involved in. And then here is a photo from the groundbreaking of uh, Kit Keller on the left and Judy Jepson. So like many other volunteers and board members, 
Judy Jepson got involved following the push to start a museum. As a member of the Cedarburg Landmarks Commission, she helped choose a location for the museum. She shared with me her memories of one of the earliest visits that they took to the farm and how she fell in love with the property. And as someone passionate about historical preservation, Judy told me of her pride in helping to establish the museum on this historic property. Susan Graham Wernicke started out volunteering in the gift shop, uh, but she eventually uh, used her marketing skills to help benefit the museum. And here she shares her story about that. 2006-ish, working in the old farmhouse when the museum was on the lower level of the farmhouse. Um, and um, I just was like a volunteer greeting people and doing whatever else they could do in the world with the tiny little um, shop we had there. And then around, I would say 2009 or 2010, Kate Walters came and asked me if I would be going to do marketing for this book. Now, my background is marketing. I've done you know, I have a marketing degree from the Kellogg Register Management in um, at Western, and I've done marketing consulting. So this was like really a fun thing for me to do. So as Susan shared here, many of the volunteers brought their specific skills to the museum to help, uh, help it succeed. And here is another photo from the groundbreaking event. This one is of Carolyn Joss and her son, Steve. Who, Carolyn was another volunteer that I spoke with who spent a lot of time in the gift shop. She described to me that after retiring, she got antsy, as she put it. Um, so she got a job at Michael's and that led her to learning about the museum. So in 2009, she started volunteering in the farmhouse as well. Another uh, serendipitous linkage to the museum, if you will, to help fill a need. All right, moving right along to part two, we're going to be focusing more on these women's dedication to the fiber arts and how they're connected. While, because while many of the women that I spoke with are fiber artists or quilters themselves, not everyone was a per, is personally uh, a fiber artist, but everyone has a deep respect for for this uh, creative endeavor. Here is a clip from my interview with Judy Zolzer Levine, where she shared with me how she got involved in a variety of fiber arts from a very early age. I started sewing when I was 11, and my mother taught me to sew. She was a very accomplished seamstress and tailor. Um, my grandmother was a quilter. My aunts were quilters. My great grandmothers were quilters. Uh, we used to laugh that my mother had enough fabric she could open her own fabric store, and she did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and of course, that meant that her fabric collection even grew. <laughs> um, nothing to rival my fabric collection. Um, so then um, in 4-H, I signed up, or she suggested I take knitting. So I started knitting, and then a trip to visit an aunt, she taught me how to crochet. Um, my mother's sister on a different trip taught me how to tat. I picked up that first for lace. Uh, so basically, if it's done with, oh, and then I also taught myself needlepoint cool embroidery, you know, as pastime says to, you know, let's do something. Um, uh, so if it's done with needle and thread, I, I basically do it. All right. 
great. The only thing I don't do is I don't weave. It took too much equipment, I think. <laughs> Like Judy, many of the women who shared their stories with me learned to sew, knit, or crochet from an early age, and it became a lifelong interest. Carol Butsky is one example, as she learned to crochet, knit, and embroider when she was around middle school age. And for some, like Carol, the fiber arts became intertwined with personal and professional pursuits. She started quilting as an adult and became a certified quilt judge working for international shows such as those held by the, the American Quilters Society. And here we have a clip from Kay Walters, who, as many of you know, is another lifelong fiber artist whose memories and endeavors weave between the personal and the professional. From her memories of sewing doll clothes to owning the Cedarburg woolen mill, Kay has always been connected to the fiber arts. And the audio in this clip is difficult to hear, so I've provided the transcript so that you can all follow along. Sorry about that. Apparently I'm having all of the technical difficulties today. Apologies. <laughs> Here we go. And next we have a clip from Maribeth Schmidt, who also talked about the joys of quilting, particularly when it comes to something that challenges her. Well, I've been quilting since uh, 1970, but I always didn't quilt during that period to now. Uh, I would say a couple hundred. Now I give some away, uh, like I said earlier, I like I belong to a couple groups that uh, have quilting challenges, so there's certain rules. They're kind of picky, and uh, but I love the challenge of doing that. So uh, a lot of my quilts are challenged. Oh, and then I've got quilts that I have purchased. I have a, a collection of um, oh, probably 35 signature quilts. So those are generally quilts that have some kind of inscription on them, like a person's name or their birth date or the city where they're living, something like that. So I, I you know, in, in, with making them, I also collect them. And what you're seeing here is an excerpt from an article that Ann King wrote in 2011 on her mother, Marion Wolf's love of quilting. I was so grateful that Ann shared this as one of my hopes for this project was to learn about the founding mothers who've already passed so that their contributions and their passions live on in the museum's history. It reads, Marion's interest in quilting developed to occupy her time in the evenings while home with my dad. She enjoyed piecing and quilting by hand. She was a member of the South Shore Quilters Guild and contributed to the charity quilt projects regu regularly. She wasn't one to enter shows, rather she enjoyed making quilts for her family, such as for weddings and babies. Among her treasured creations are the skating quilt she made for me and her daughter. 
her white on white quilt, appliqued eagle bedspread, and a wall hanging made with wool. She loved the Amish style quilts and purchased some antique quilts as well. Much like what Mary Beth had to say, um, oftentimes I noticed that making quilts went along hand in hand with collecting quilts because there's just such a deep love for the art form. And here we have uh, part of my interview with Kay Bulky Schrader, um, who talked about how quilts are important on many levels, particularly for conveying women's history, because not only um, are many of the women I spoke with quilters or fiber artists themselves, but like I said earlier, everyone shares a profound love and respect for the art form. I always like history, and I really believe you need to know where you came from in order to know where you're going. And I look at that in quilts and, you know, I've been fortunate to be on the, you know, committee that has documented lots of old quilts and new quilts, but I, you know, there is so much there to learn from the stories that quilts tell, uh, the workmanship, the, uh, creativity or just creativity there is just so much there to learn and and it's the women's history is part of that and I I, I just feel that's really really important um, and then the last clip I will share with you from this section is uh, from my interview with Luella she is sharing some of the words that one of her quilting students um, told her, and it comes back to how important family heirloom quilts are. Here. Sorry, it looks like it's really thinking hard about loading. Well, I suppose we won't be hearing <laughs> this clip from Luella today, as it seems to be having some difficulties. Um, but again, um, what she shares here in this video is all about the importance of an heirloom quilt and the fact that it's something to hang on to from someone after they're gone in particular was something that hit home for her. Um, because these creations provide a connection with the people that we love who made them. The last section of today's presentation, uh, I really wanna focus on the relationships that grew at the museum because there's such a strong community surrounding it. In this clip, um, I just want to preface by saying that as you might have noticed from the section on how many of these women got involved with the Wisconsin Quilt History Project and the museum, uh, oftentimes it was those personal relationships that helped connect people uh, to the museum later on. It was the pre-existing relationships that communities of fiber artists and quilters um, create. It's the shared interests, the volunteering together and the working towards a common goal uh, at the museum though, which helped enforce this already strong community and the bonds of friendship that exist within it. And this clip from Nina Eldman uh, is important, I think, because uh, 
because of that point that it reinforces that these relationships were oftentimes founded outside of the museum. Um, but then the involvement within the museum is what helped them grow. Of North Shore quilters um, back then, probably in the late 90s, I would say, maybe 2000. And Marion Wolf, who you've heard your name has probably come up in your interviews, who was a mover and shaker to really give this museum a, a boost. <clears throat> um, I made friends with her in the Guild, and um, she knew that I was a teacher, a school librarian, a storyteller, and I did, I did um, lesson plans often using quilts as an example of parts of history. And also someone else in the guild, uh, someone named Barbara Gross and I developed a um, traveling quilt show. We called it Quilts on Wheels. And next we have this clip from my interview with Elrid Johnson, which to me encapsulates how cherished the bonds of friendship made through a mutual love and respect of quilting and the fiber arts are. Because when going through personal loss, like Elrid mentions in this clip, or if for like some of the women I spoke with, they moved to Wisconsin without friends or family in the area, it was the community surrounding the museum and surrounding the fiber arts that provided a place to connect with, uh, connect with others. I've always been a, a quilt guild groupie too. So at one point I belonged to like six different guilds, but you know, part, part of that was I've been, I've been widowed for 30 years. And so belonging to quilt guilds and being active was my, my social life and a lot of my life spun along the way it always had, even though my husband was gone. So I, I value my quilting friends. And this is uh, a clip from Carolyn Joss, who shared a unique story about one of the friendships that she made while volunteering in the farmhouse gift shop. And again, the audio is very quiet. So I hope you can follow along with the transcript that I've provided. I loved this example in part, I think, because of the distance um, and just how influential the museum is that it became this hub for so many people. In this clip from Judy Raditz, um, she shares her memories uh, from working in the farmhouse. Um, <clears throat> but she also recalled helping install exhibits with friends. Granted, uh, and the shows were wonderful. I mean, I can, I can still remember quite vividly the, the exhibits at the little house, which you wouldn't think two rooms would be worth your time, but they were. They were wonderfully put together. And, and um, back then, before all the computer stuff, uh, well, and I used to sit after the thing was up until about two in the morning doing the documentation because uh, Luella can spell and I can type, so we're perfect together. And uh, so then we would put all the documentation up and things like that. So got to, got my good friend uh, Lucille Cagle, I don't know if you're speaking with her, but she, she was at the same time, uh, she came aboard at the same time. And um, so as we were putting things up, we became you know, lifelong friends. Uh, so that was 
a lot of those. I know you've talked to Sandy Meyer and and other people. Um, good group of people. A good a good reason to be there together. So much of what kept people, I think, coming back and volunteering from what I learned through these interviews was how integral the people were to keep people coming back. As uh, Judy mentions there is just the community, the positivity that grew was, it was just a, something that everyone wanted to be a part of, something that everyone wanted to help with and join in on. And uh, here's a short clip from my interview with Norma Klimke, uh, who fondly recalled all of the excellent volunteers that she got to work with. Um, and also thinking about how crucial volunteers are, not only in the museum's past, but for the ongoing success. Always, you know, we always need volunteers. And that's a big portion of uh, how you can succeed is with the number of people willingly volunteer. So we've had some excellent people. And then in this clip uh, from Ellie D'Elia, she talks about the dedication of all the volunteers whose hard work created the museum and kept it open, particularly in those early days um, before they hired Melissa. That we, um we used to talk about um, and, and remark about was how loyal and involved our volunteers were. I, I, I'm trying to remember the number when we first opened, but we had, you know, from coming and going various activities, I think over a hundred volunteers. And without the volunteers, we really couldn't have kept the doors open for all of the hours that we wanted to stay open, which are the hours we have today a lot of hours for a small museum. Um, so really the people who were involved were dedicated uh, beyond beyond belief. And so yeah, it really is a, a, a miracle that, that it happened. But it also seems like it, it meant to be. And it, it often seemed that we if we had a need or a dream, or how are we going to get this money? Or how are we going to make that happen? That if we just really wanted it to happen or thought of it to happen and thought this needs to happen, it sort of just did. I mean, if this thing seemed to have a little divine providence all, all the way along, it, it's uh, it, to me really a, a remarkable story. I think um, Ellie's comments here particularly stood out to me just because it doesn't underplay the enormity of the task uh, it just sometimes felt like these things happened because so many people were pulling in the same direction with the same amount of energy. The museum was and is a community effort, as all of these stories attest. And not unlike a quilt, it's a labor of love. I thought the juxtaposition of the, the Mariner's Compass quilt uh, and the museum building as we know and love it today uh, helped underscore that connection. And I'd like to end with a quote from Terry Sankovitz, who you can see here on the left uh, in a university days class. <clears throat> I so enjoyed my time at the museum and still feel very connected to the building and the women I worked with during that time. There are small signs of my involvement in hidden places, the stamped concrete, my signature on top of one of the barn beams, the rolling carts my father made for the education center and the time capsule buried in the silo. There is something about this that just, it shows everything that everyone has spoken about. It's the personal connections, it's the connection to the art, it's the connection to the people that everyone felt as well as just the incredible investment in time and talent that everyone put in. I would like to thank all of the women that I spoke with over the course of this project for sharing their stories, for trusting the museum to 
uh, be a good steward of this history. And I wanna thank all of you for joining us today. And for those of you who've been on this ride for over the course of the months that I've been presenting, um, thank you so much for joining all of those other presentations as well. It means a lot to know that everyone is still as excited about the museum uh, as everyone who's working there and volunteering there is yet. Um, hopefully you've all been sharing some stories in the, in the chat and in the comments. Uh, if there's any, any of those that you'd like to share um, before we end the presentation today, uh, I, hope, I hope you do so. Are there any comments or questions or stories? Anne shared that all of her mom's quilts involvement rubbed, rubbed off on her and she loves being connected to and supporting the museum to this day and that she's been a quilter since 1993. <laughs> the family connections uh, that people talked about through the course of these interviews were some of my favorite to listen to, just the passion that everyone has, whether it's handed down or whether they shared it with their own families. It was really neat. Then I guess uh, it looks like that is a wrap on our presentations for many hands. <laughs> Uh, which if some of you have noticed, uh, many hands make light the work. I don't know if it made making the museum any lighter, but I think it made it more pleasant all around. So thank you all again for coming.